seller carry back 1031 exchange with paper, a promissory note in a 1031 exchange. How do you do that? Things you need to know in this video when you're going through the exchange process and taking a seller carry back financing option. So I think that's things that every client, every investor, and every broker needs to know. So there's two things about the installment sale that we're looking at today. And when you've had decided to do an installment sale and you've decided that you will carry the paper and finance the buyer. So how is that seller financing going to be treated in a 1031 tax deferred exchange? So there's two elements to this on the promissory note and the deed of trust. Are these instruments going to be inside the exchange? In other words, go through the exchange or held outside of the exchange and not part of the exchange. I think that's something that the seller and the brokers and the qualified intermediaries need to know before you accept a contract with seller financing on your property. Usually when I'm looking at an investment property, a very important question always comes up and I think everybody probably has the same question unless you're paying cash. And the important question is, how am I going to finance this property? And then I come to the conclusion of asking the seller, will you carry paper? And we saw in the last video I made that seller financing is very big in the United States. So will you carry paper? And the seller is saying, well, how will that work? There's lots of questions about the property, the ownership, and the reason for selling, and what will you do with the cash? And those are all valid questions, and that questions about what will you do with the cash is not an invasive question, and it has to do with benefits. The seller is seeking the benefits that they can get by cash and going and buying some other property. The investor is thinking about, I might have the benefits that the seller is trying to gain with that cash. Perhaps we could do a 1031 exchange or just a trade. So what will you do with the cash is about the benefits that you are seeking and trying to get from this transaction. So there's a lot of choices about the paper, the term, the rate, the risk, the buyer risk. And those are all choices that you can make during this uh, seller financing carry back sort of transaction. Now, in this video, I'm assuming that you will carry paper and we want to know about how that paper is treated in the exchange process. Now, will the paper be inside the exchange where it goes through the exchange and you're still seeking to do a tax deferred exchange 100%? Or is the paper held outside of the exchange and you're just going to treat that like an ordinary sale and you'll have a partial exchange? So how does the seller carry back work with a 453 installment sale, which would be a seller carry back? And there's a few things that we just need to look at and be aware of so that we can counsel the client. I think counseling is one of the most important things of the process, not only for the client, but for the broker, and also to know how the intermediary and the CPA will view this seller carryback and taking it through the 1031 tax deferred exchange, and whether the note should be inside the exchange or outside the exchange. So let's look at no 1031 exchange. I'm just going to sell or carry back and finance the property for a buyer and how will that be treated? A regular installment sale, a regular 453 installment sale, just an owner carry, seems pretty easy, right? Well, the seller in this case is the beneficiary. Their name will be on the promissory note and the deed of trust. Could be their personal name, could be an entity like an LLC or something like that. But also note that recapture of depreciation in the year of sale will probably come up. So there are concerns and recapture is a big concern because it may affect your liquidity in the sale. And also early payoff and the loan to value and what happens in a foreclosure. And a big one to me is tracking the payments. There's always a question about how much is owed 
or how much has been paid in the promissory note and the deed of trust when a seller is holding that. And then also another concern is uh, what if I need the cash? What if I want to sell my note? Can I sell it at face value? What can I do? Do I have to take a huge discount or can I take that paper and trade it or buy something else with it? So the note is going to be excluded from the exchange. The seller of the relinquished property is the beneficiary. So your the note is not part of the exchange. The seller's name is going to be on the note and the deed of trust, and that's a partial exchange. Now, here's the onion effect. Uh, there's a many types of depreciation that you'll look at when you're buying different types of investment property. So that has an impact on the recapture of that depreciation that you have taken. Most of the properties that I deal with are straight line depreciation. It's usually the 39 year depreciation schedule or the 27 and a half year depreciation schedule. And I can understand that. I think the onion effect will come in when you start to figure out the depreciation recapture on the seller carryback in the year of sale. And that straight line depreciation or that accelerated depreciation will have to be re recaptured. And I think this is a great time that you would need to call your 1031 exchange specialist or your CPA or tax attorney and discuss those uh, implications with them. So outside the exchange, you're just taking a seller carry back or you're going through the exchange for a partial exchange and you're going to carry back the note and the deed of trust and you're going to have accumulated depreciation and it's taxed at the rate of 25%. So if you carry back, it could be a sticker shock if you are not aware of what that accumulated depreciation is and that it has to be paid in the year of sale. So that is a surprise that you do not want to find out at the closing table. Here's an exchange analysis form that I use in most all of my dealings with investment property. I try to be aware of what the depreciation is, what kind of depreciation that the seller has taken, and what is going to be the impact of the depreciation recapture and what the benefits of the 1031 tax deferred exchange will be or could be and what kind of tax they would have to pay if they don't do an exchange. So in this case, the depreciation recapture is around $26,000. And that's why I said that that could be quite a sticker shock when you find out that in the year of closing that you have a $26,000 tax bill, and that could affect your liquidity quite seriously. So in each of these seller carry scenarios, your prorated basis is returned, your interest is taxed as ordinary income, and your gain on future payments is taxed at the rate of 15%. Let's look at inside the 1031 exchange. There is a little bit of a difference, and that difference is that the beneficiary must be the qualified intermediary. The terms agreed on by the buyer and the seller for the note and the deed of trust are probably about the same, but the beneficiary who gets the payments must be the qualified intermediary if you're going to take the paper through the exchange. And all payments must go to the QI, and the QI holds the note and the deed of trust. In fact, they own that note and deed of trust during the exchange process. So inside the exchange, uh, the promissory note and deed of trust must be in the name of the QI and not in your personal name or the name of your LLC. The entire relinquished property transaction will be assigned to the qualified intermediary and they will take that process through the 1031 exchange. Now, if you don't have a note and deed of trust, some states use a contract for deed or a land contract. One complication that I can see and that the seller carryback is not like kind. The qualified intermediary is holding more than cash. In other words, the QI is holding the promissory note and the deed of trust in the exchange, and that's not like kind. 
And so that is a complication. So there are some solutions that can be handled in this 1031 exchange with a seller carry back note. Number one, the replacement property owner could accept that third party note in that deed of trust that you are carrying back on the property that you sold. Sometimes that's kind of hard to do when you have a promissory note and a deed of trust on a piece of property and you want to take that note and that deed of trust and go buy something else. To get somebody on a third party to accept that is kind of difficult. But if they do, you have a 1031 tax deferred exchange. Or you can convert the note to cash by selling to an investor. You probably have to take a discount and that cash you get out of that note sale, you can contribute that to the exchange and then you would have a like kind exchange. The third thing is that you could contribute personal funds from your own account in the amount that would be equal to the face value of the note and then you would have a like kind exchange. When the exchange is completed, the note and the deed of trust is assigned back to you because you have cash in the exchange. The boot paid or contributed is offset by the boot received and therefore there is no tax due. There is no tax due. Including a seller carry back financing in your sale of your property is a pretty big decision. And I think that the seller, the broker, and probably the buyer need to be counseled on how that will work in a 1031 tax deferred exchange. Counsel the clients. I think that is very important that all the parties to the exchange, if it's a seller carry back, that you be well counseled on what happens to that seller carry back note and deed of trust and whether it should be part of the exchange or excluded from the exchange. So real estate strategy. Are you trying to get out of real estate or just selling your real estate and want to get the payments and you're tired of the tenants, the toilets and the trash and you just want to have an annuity that pays you every month? The monthly payments are good. It's better than bank rate financing and you're familiar with the collateral and the gain is spread over the term of the note. So I think that would be a very good reason to think about seller financing. But I think you also need to know the steps in the process. The buyer, the seller and the brokers need to understand how that note will be treated if you're going to go through the 1031 tax deferred process. So thanks for watching.